Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Francois, Francois Caron. I'm from SolarWinds, obviously, so I'm in product management. I own the product manager team, which uh, takes care of all the network management products. So uh, that's, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, um, with the portfolio that, uh, that we have. Hopefully, in two hours, you will. Uh, and um, so that's me in a nutshell. As you cannot tell from my accent, I'm based in Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm just originally from, uh, from France, but I moved to the US 12, 13 years ago now. Uh, so I'm, uh, like I said, I'm in Austin, Texas. And, um, and I'm very happy. I heard a lot about this event and about you guys, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. So tell me about the package. Thank you. Hi, I'm Patrick Hubbard. I'm also from Austin. Um, I am currently the head geek of SolarWinds, which basically uh, we, uh, some of you guys knew maybe Josh Stevens, and uh, he was originally in that role. And um, I've been with the company a long time, and I am essentially a troublemaker who does things that customers would normally be doing. So I work with the customers a lot. I built originally all of our online demo portfolio, and um, I uh, work with the uh, dev guys a lot and basically try to find new and exciting ways to abuse our products. So um, we'll uh, go ahead and get started here. Sure, go ahead. All go right. Ahead. Do the agenda. <clears throat> Look at the agenda here. This isn't as daunting as it should be, and that is my one and only super exciting transition for you guys who are on the video feed to uh, cause uh, problems with the transcoding. Um, we're gonna we'll do a little company uh, introduction here. We'll go over our the uh, portfolio, which has grown significantly over the last couple of years. So there's probably a lot of products that either you haven't heard about or they've uh, been extended and enhanced. So it's a, a chance to to look at all of those. Um, we'll do a uh, update on our uh, network uh, management products. Those will include the uh, entire portfolio of network management products. We're not going to focus on some of the uh, app manager products, but of course, if you guys have questions, we're happy to take any of those, or especially around integration, or maybe where we see customers using both. Um, we'll cover some best practices with working with SolarWinds products. Um, we're going to actually dive into architecture a little bit, because that's one of the areas where we've made a pretty significant investment over the last couple of years. And um, if we have time, I'm actually going to do a live API tool set SDK demo for you so you can kind of see how that works. Um, I'm going to talk about some of our free products. And the key word here is product, not tool. We've really actually now started releasing fully featured products for free. They go beyond some of the basic functionality that some of the free tools offered. And then we have a uh, surprise uh, geek fun thing for you guys that we'll, we'll cover at the last bit. And uh, we think you that uh, you'll really enjoy that. So I want to start with just one quick question before I hand it back to Francois, and that is, which one of these statements is true? Is SolarWinds a, a network management company or is it an IT management company? B. B? Well, it's, all the above. it's actually, yeah, it's both. And so you guys saw the slide before, but uh, yes. <laughs> but no, it it's always all of the above when right. you ask that question. <laughs> right. But it is both. And I mean, we, um, I, I would love to say that we're uh, bleeding edge and just are constantly looking for new markets to go into, but the truth is, we let our customers tell us um, what their needs are and kind of guide the direction for uh, areas that we cover. But fundamentally, if you look at our product line, the, the, the bulk of it, and certainly the, uh, the uh, longest uh, and, and oldest products are the network uh, uh, management products. So the answer is both. We offer a lot of products that are related and in sort of in the covered IT generalist category, but all the core of the products that we offer is still networking. And with that. All right. Thanks, Patrick. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, talking about the portfolio, basically, we have about 20 products today. And when we mean products, we're not counting tools and free tools. If you count everything, we probably have, including free tools, something like 50 different deliverable. But as far as the product themselves, we have about 20. What you saw on the previous slide was this list of terrible acronyms, which will uh, go through um, this morning. Uh, that's about six or seven products. So that's the netman, what we call the netman terrible terminology, network management portfolio. We have pretty much an equivalent portfolio, which is the sysman system management, as well as other stuff. So we'll go through some of that. The point we're trying to make here is show that Yes, we have a pretty broad portfolio. We're pretty much competing with the big four in terms of the breadth of the portfolio, right? for the HP, the BMC, the uh, uh, CA and IBM of the world. In terms of breadth of product, we're not quite there yet, but we are pretty, we're pretty close. The way we're growing the portfolio is both by integration of acquired products, and we've put here a few of the uh, logos of the company that we uh, acquired. We'll see some of them more in detail during this, uh, during this presentation. 
uh, but also uh, via organic growth. We, are, we have obviously have a very large development compared to our size. We have a pretty large development organization. We're integrating, we're developing our own products, obviously. Um, uh, we'll speak a lot about integration because something we don't want to become is we don't want to become the supermarket of IT management software, right? Buying stuff, keeping them non-integrated, doing, having their, have their own life and their own roadmap and basically not fix what the, uh, our audience needs. We'll speak about what our audience is, but basically most of our audience, we have dozens of thousands of customers, but our primary audience is basically a generalist audience. So this is this small and medium uh, uh, business uh, that uh, with this one or two guys that pretty much are doing everything, network, systems, servers, applications, um, and, and you name it. So integrate from that perspective, integrating the product and avoiding management silos is really a key part of our strategy. And, and again, we'll, we'll go back on that point. We, we develop product, we buy products, but they all have something in common. They're easy to find on our website, they're easy to download, they're easy to evaluate, and they are easy to buy as well, I have to say. They're very aggressively priced, usually, uh, and more importantly, they're easy to use. So ease of use is our really key competitive advantage. When we talk to our customers regularly and say, why did you buy our stuff, or why did you replace one of the big four stuff with ours? Ease of use comes back, what, 90% of the time. It's easy to use, I evaluated it, I saw the value of this product in 15 minutes, between 15 minutes and an hour, I didn't need to talk to a sales engineer, I bought the product. This is, this is what we call the uh, low touch sales process and this is possible because the products support that, because they're easy to evaluate and buy. That's a, that's a great point because one of the things that continues to be a part of the way that we sell software is we don't offer professional services. And that means the product has to actually be something that you can download and use. So as we've added some products to our portfolio and done a couple of acquisitions, we've made sure that those products actually also fit that model. Because if you want to provide a broad set of services and it requires a bunch of people on site to do the integration, that is not something that we're going to be able to make uh, an easy eval experience and a purchasing experience yeah. online. We have no training, no professional services. So to try to compare that and contrast that with, we keep talking about the big four. Community but training. Yeah, Thwack. yeah. Community. We have a very large community. Who, who in this room is uh, aware of what Thwack is? Have you ever looked at Thwack? All right. So that's a very, very active community. We'll say a few words about it. But all right, let's move. So that's a depiction of the uh, non-network. We'll I'll do network after because that's what we're going to focus on. But just to put things in perspective, this is the system storage uh, and desktop management portfolio. Uh, so we try to organize them by different colors. The blue stuff is what we have for what basically uh, for the data, for managing the data centers, servers and applications. So the flagship product in this area is clearly SAM, um, which stands for Server and Application uh, Monitor. Um, and, and we have others. I won't go into everything um, in the interest of time, but just remember that we cover server applications, storage, and virtualization. Then moving to the desktop part of the portfolio, patch management, um, log and uh, even correlation, as well as remote administration. So this, this, and these are companies that we bought. We, you had the logo on the previous slide. Specifically for fault, incident, and problem management, mobile admin, Alert Central, uh, we'll come back on Alert Central. You'll see a demo of uh, Alert Central. Um, that's at the end. That's the piece you'll do. Uh, you'll do at the end. And Web Help Desk. We have a basically trouble ticketing asset management, but mostly trouble ticketing system as part of the again non-network portfolio. All right. So now moving. Sorry, the presentation is different. I stalled slide. I didn't have time to redo them consistently. But the point is the same: is to present the different products that we have in the network management portfolio. So we go a little bit more in detail in terms of how it works because this is today's focus. Let's start from the from the bottom. Um, Solowins come historically from network management, which means that this is the area network management where you will see the most integrated product because pretty much all these products are organically grown from basically our own development, which means, which is the reason why they're actually running on something that we call Orion core platform technology, which is um, basically a common set of services like 
reporting, like discovery, like um, topology mapping, like alerting. All these different services are provided by this core platform to the product that they're running on top of it. The point I'm making is, well, whether you do traffic monitoring or you do performance monitoring or you do VoIP management, at some point you're going to need to generate reports, right? So why would we provide a different reporting system for all of these products? Our users don't want to have to relearn a different reporting system, alerting system, discovery system for every different domain. That's why we've create, we've designed this core platform to provide these common services to all the applications. So you have to relearn as less as possible every time you buy and install a new product. You just relearn, you just learn only what you need to learn which is specific to this domain. All right, so what are the domains? So the, one of the, in the network management portfolio, NPM is the flagship product that's historically one of the first products that we had. Uh, it does fault and performance monitoring for network. It covers wireline, it covers wireless. We'll, we'll go through some demos, obviously. You'll see a lot of demos and illustrations during this, uh, this presentation. So that's what fault and performance monitoring is. Uh, on top of it, because uh, this is a prerequisite to run the NetFlow analyzer. That's based, I mean, you guys are familiar with NetFlow. We call it NetFlow because of the popularity of NetFlow, but it actually pretty much covers all flow technology except app flows. It does S-Flow, it does pretty much whatever is available out there, uh, including obviously Cisco, Cisco NetFlow. So the, the acronym is NTA. Then moving, uh, moving on through the portfolio, VoIP management, VoIP and network quality management. So what we do here is that's basically how we manage IP SLA, Cisco's IP SLA technology. Who's, everybody's familiar with IP SLA technology, right? This packet testing thing, so latency, jitter, all that stuff. Um, that's, what we, that's what we do here. More recently, we've actually added something that customers wanted us to add for actually a pretty long time. They keep telling us, well, the, the IPSLS stuff is great, but there's one big limitation. It's all artificial traffic. It's all synthetic traffic, right? The, I won't tell me about my actual calls, how my actual calls are, are doing. So we've added the CDR piece. We're talking to the CCM, the Cisco call manager, and we've added the call detail record information into the product. So not only we can give you a view of the quality of the network, VoIP or not VoIP, by the way, whether it's used for VoIP or not, based on the IP SLA technology, but also we have the actual calls, the call detail records. And that's, uh, like, and that's actually a great history lesson. I mean, not that SolarWinds would ever change a product name, but does anyone remember the uh, VoIP monitor product? Yeah. And then that became IP SLA manager? Well, because that's basically what you were tracking. <coughs> right, exactly. And then okay. we just expanded more of the IP SLA operations. Right. Which, which really works well for my customer base because some of them were using I, the VoIP monitor to say, well, can I just track router stuff with this too? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it, it gives you a better idea of what it's really used for. Yeah, right. Yes. So, this is basically the same product. We just realized that that VoIP, that VoIP uh, requirement and be able to really actually inter uh, get more data out of the uh, call data records was something that we kind of lost in the, in the adoption of a more broad IPSLA yep. tool. So, it's still the core of that, which means that it's, it's actually been around for a while and those, uh, those operations and the, the UI is used by a lot of people. Yep. So next one is IPAM. Obviously, IP address management is a key component if you want to manage a to manage a network. We'll see a few a few screens as well about um, IP IP management. So the use case here is pretty simple: is if you if you're a very small shop, you may be happy with just a spreadsheet, right? You have your spreadsheet with all your subnets and IP addresses and all that. But as soon as you grow a little bit, for example, you try to share this spreadsheet between two different people who are managing both of them, the IP address of your network, right? How do you share this spreadsheet? How do you reliably have one guy making an update and not overwriting the update from, I mean, the second guy? Just a simple use case like this, very rapidly you end up with the fact that spreadsheets are not sufficient and not reliable, and you need something which is as easy to use as a spreadsheet, but a little bit more sophisticated. It can help you delegating privileges and delegating rights. I mean, you handle that part of the network, you handle that part of the network, those subnets, and we don't collide uh, between each other. And there are other great use cases, we'll talk more, but that's what IPAM is. User device tracker, it basically adding the U, it's basically adding the user vision to this. It's, the main use case is tracking 
who are your users, where are they connected in terms of not only wired switches, but as well wireless. We've recently added the fact that we can track user, users through, the wi through their wireless connections. You can keep the history of where a customer was connected. Uh, I mean, every time he, he or she, she changed. Um, so those are the main use cases. Active Directory log on. Active Directory, obviously, is the way that we, 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 get, the, we get the user. NCM, Network Configuration Manager, that's the NCCM um, uh, break of the portfolio. That's basically backing up, um, backing up configurations of your routers and switches, um, automating changes. Typical example that everybody gives is, where, let's say every 90 days you need to change the enable password on your, your 500 routers. Right? You're not going to do it manually. So basically, NCM is a product that does that for you, connects to the console, logs, logs in the console, does issues the command to basically uh, perform the change and move to the, move to the next one. Um, other features, but that's what really this is about. This one is the last kind of baby of the uh, portfolio, if you will. It's called FSM Firewall uh, uh, Security Manager. It's a typo, by the way. It's a copy-paste. That's not Firewall Configuration Management. That's Firewall Security Manager. I'm sorry. I thought it was the product name. So Firewall Config Management, but from a security standpoint, right? From a, the config from a pure download uh, backup configuration is handled by NCM. But this is some kind of view that as a, an expert system that basically looks at your config and tells you, you know what, you have 200 ACL rules that are completely redundant or actually conflicting with each other, right? Maybe you want to clean up that configuration because it's going to make it much easier to read. And it might make your firewall a little bit, I mean, faster because it has less logic, less rules to actually process. It does security audit. It has a, 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 a library of 120 checks uh, that are kind of stolen from from DSSTIG, from for the uh, from the federal market, from uh, PCI, from many different standards, and basically gives you recommendation on uh, whether or not a your configs are clean and whether or not they are secure. The most kind of spectacular feature of FSM is the fact that. FSM actually understands semantically what the configs are doing. It understands how the traffic is going to go through this firewall just by looking at the configurations and the routing tables. So the product has some kind of a model of the network in, in memory and can say, well, guess what? If you have this firewall connected to this router, connected to this router, and that firewall, right, I can tell you that the change you're about to make in your config Right, because I have the end-to-end -end visibility, the change you're going to make, you're going to cut the access to this remote site, or you're going to open a security hole. Maybe you don't want to do that. So the point I'm making is it understands the end-to-end -end traffic across firewalls and router even before it's actually in production. So the use case is, right, whoever, who has never, I mean, shoot himself in the foot by configuring an ACL, right? And it's the wrong ACL and you just cut your own access or you just cut access to, I mean, from this remote side to the main, uh, to the, uh, to the main network or that sort of things. Well, basically what this product does is you put the configuration and you ask the product, am I doing something wrong? Am I about to do something wrong? And the product tells you yes or no, it gives you an opportunity to change that before you go to production. Or how many times do you get a, a ticket with an exception and somebody asks for uh, an exception to a policy, but you have really no way to test it until yeah. you close the ticket and move on, and a day later they're still complaining that they don't have the access. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly the kind of use case we're covering here. Did you mention what firewalls are supported by that product? No, I did not. So we support uh, uh, Cisco PIX, we support uh, ASAs, we support... IOS, I mean the ACLs from uh, the firewalling piece of the uh, of the of IOS. We support checkpoints. We support Juniper SSG. We're about to support Juniper SRX. We're a little bit late on that. And for the future, we have thoughts about. We have no, nothing exposed <laughs> in the roadmap, but in terms of what we see demand for, we see a lot of demand for Palo Alto. Uh, the next gen firewalling Palo Alto seems to be a pretty good job at. Convincing the market that fire, I mean, next-gen firewalling application aware firewalling is the next big thing, and, and I think they're right. Um, I think they're kind of actually stealing the market from Juniper. I think Juniper completely missed the SSG to um, SRX 
move because they're forcing their engineers to relearn everything. It's a different platform. And I've heard that at least five times from customers I've spoken to. These guys said, well, if Juniper forces me to retrain completely my engineers from, uh, in terms of migrating from SSG to SRX, I would rather tr retrain my engineers to something which is really next gen, like Fortinet or Palo Alto. And my opinion is that is, is Palo Alto is doing a good job at stealing that market from from Juniper, so that's why Palo Alto is on the list as well as Fortinet. Um, so I, I've got to go ahead. So I was going to ask is as you get into some of the next gen firewalls, you get higher and higher in the OSI model. Right. Is that product going to support that, that deeper pack? Because I mean that that gets a lot more complex than what you guys have to do. Yeah, that's that's exactly what we're working on. Absolutely, okay. that's exactly the strategy. So I wanted to kind of frame a little bit of this discussion based on some of the stuff we were talking about yesterday, because the more I look at what you guys have up here, the more I realize that you've created SDN by accident. That's interesting. <laughs> so you, no, no, you have. Look at what we're trying to do with okay. SDN today. Yep, we're course. trying to create you know, centralized configuration change and management, the ability to oh. orchestrate device changes. Yep. You know, Are you calling Kiwi Cat Tools SDN? <laughs> I mean, come on, dude. They have created a platform I mean, let's face it, you could take all of those things and plug them into a software device, and that's what some people are calling SDN. I understand that. You could also call my crappy shit a shell scripts on GitHub SDN at that point. While the, while the tool's awesome, and I love your, I love that tool. I'm glad you bought it, and I'm glad you integrated it. Yeah. Well, but, but okay, but we're... <laughs> puppet screen scraping at the end of the day, unless there's an agent. A puppet... I mean, some of that stuff's still kind of screen scraping at the end of the day. Uh, no I don't even call Puppet S the SDN. No, no, I'm no. saying we, we talked about this at Network Field Day 3. Yeah. Well, we brought this up very specifically and said, you guys aren't there yet, but you're coll collecting a huge amount of data that begins to start looking like the beginnings or the orchestration piece of what could be an SS or SDN plan. Yeah, that's, that's, and I understand the reasoning. I definitely there, There's some interesting ties there. Yeah, but I think... And this actually goes back to the discussion that Josh and I were present for at Network Field Day 3. You know, which firewalls do you support? Well, we support the Cisco firewalls, we're going to support the Juniper ones, and then our customers are telling us we're supporting Palo Alto. And I know that you guys are very customer focused when you want the feedback because we all, you know, obviously we don't want to support every packet filter on the planet because that would drive the engineers nuts yeah. because you're not writing to something like an open flow spec or something yeah. where I can write one instruction set. You guys basically are creating screen scraping and, and a whole bunch of other stuff to make this all work. But if you could go out and say, listen, we're going to, you know, we're going to get these firewalls or we're going to be able to configure those devices, you know, it's like when it's like when I go shopping. It's like that's the one thing I never knew I didn't I needed because I never thought I needed it. Right. And so when you're like, oh well, you know, we can do that we can, you know, jam configuration into a Palo Alto, oh and a sonic wall and a watch guard because we can write one script that will do all of them. Yep. That's where the that's where you guys basically transcend being a collection of tools on a platform and start being a better part of the conversation. Yeah. I think that makes so sense. so maybe framing the rest of the discussion around how you're going to take that platform forward with what we're already doing in networking because I think that with what we're trying to do, some of those tools are going to start falling away as we create scripts and to do that with the SDN APIs that and OpenFlow that we're getting from the manufacturers today. Makes sense. Well, actually, the API conversation is going to be pretty interesting in terms of driving these products from the outside based on scripts and other products. I think at the end we have a presentation on the, on the API. You'll okay. see what the API allows you to control. And again, the API operates at this level. So basically what that means is the API gives you a way to create, delete, modify the object from these applications in a completely automated way, not through the UI. So that's... And I just wanted to get that out there now so that as we move forward to the rest of this discussion, we can kind of see where all Yeah, the we can try. You can definitely try. Okay. Thank Makes you sense. All right. yeah, the, the, the other question I would have on this uh, firewall security manager, if you, if you go and look at the, um, the command line of uh, ASA or something that's been configured with this thing, how does that, I mean, does it really, I know like sometimes you use the ASDM or something, it really messes up how it's, you know, how it looks. I mean, it's, it's ridiculously large or something. And how, how does looking at the configuration that's been generated using this product compare with you know somebody that's done it by com command line or is 
Do you have a comment on that? No, I'm not sure. I, I understand the question, definitely. I'm not sure I have a good... I mean, there's, there's more than one way to... Um, to do a lot of things when you have object groups and different things like right, that. Right, yeah. Can some... you tell the firewalls was configured by a script versus a human? Right. No, you got better. Are you guys, you guys are using the, the QE cat tools back in for this, right? No. No, okay. So That's completely that. different. Okay. So do, does it support all, I guess, does it support all the same object groups and stuff like that that you would expect it to with a, a, an ASA or something like that? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And, it, yeah. and it depends on the type of device. Because if, I mean, to answer the back end question, um, it, there's a couple different ways it can do it. It'll either, originally before we bought it, they had their own mechanism for that. You can also integrate it with NCM so that NCM will pull it down and then and actually look at it. But you can think of it as a logic engine on top of the config. So to your point, it's actually gonna pull that apart and break it into objects that represent things like object groups and the ACLs and the other individual pieces. So it can actually do the simulation and, and reassembly later. I, I guess it, you know if you if you do things like with the ASDM and the ASA, the metadata is stored in the ASA. Is all the metadata stored in the ASA, or some of the metadata is stored in this product? I, I guess you know I want to put a comment on it, but I, I don't like the restrictions that's placed around the comments and it, the. It doesn't take. It does. You're asking. You're. Let me just make sure I'm at, hear your question. Are you saying that we effectively take over the ability to configure that device away from the human so that you lose the metadata that somebody's putting in through the, the uh, command line? So the answer is no. Whatever gets put back in there is still human readable. So the idea is that it can reach in, um, work with that data, and then step back out again and leave it independent so that it's no longer, it doesn't become, the, the device doesn't become an agent of, so, uh, of FSM. So yeah, I was asking, you know, two parts of the question, can it do that? And number two, you know, can I use this as a documentation tool for yeah. my ASA configuration? Yeah, absolutely. So it, you know, has a little bit more flexibility to store yeah. information mm -hmm. than the yeah. ASA itself. It, view it as if you had a security expert next to you and say, all right, you don't know what you're doing. Let me take control of that config. Let me show you that these rules are redundant. And uh, let me clean that up so the behavior doesn't change, but you reduce the number of, okay. of rules. And you know what this, I mean, from a security standpoint, you don't want to do that. Right. You make the changes in the config, you do the testing and the end-to-end -end testing before you, you put it back on the, uh, in the product. But that's all it does. It's just a super, it's just a human being who happens to be an expert in security. That's what the product does. Typical use case is um, you've got an admin who's been doing uh, kind of general networking. He's managing IP addresses and something else. And the director says, hey, we got some issues with the firewall. We think there's a few extra rules in there and some exceptions that may go back a ways. We think there's a few dozen, can you take a look at it? He can actually connect to it and come back and say, well, we have over 900 exceptions and have no idea when they were placed and be able to, to do it, uh, just the analysis, but also reporting on it to then kind of figure out what the, uh, the plan of attack is going to be to clean that up. Because so often the challenge is some exception is critical to some part of the business, but nobody might ever bother to create metadata and, and document what that thing did. So can you turn it off? I don't know. It's almost a business engineering, reverse engineering process as much as a technology one. So it makes it easy for that person to then go have those conversations to figure out how to achieve a coherent security policy with that firewall. All right. I already spoke about the integration. The, the only thing, I don't know if you guys can read actually, probably not from the back of the room, but the point I'm making here, these two charts are basically um, charts coming from a survey we just uh, did a few, uh, few weeks ago. Uh, and, the, and what we're trying to show here is the fact that our population is essentially a population, population of generalists. What we're trying to show is the guy who owns, a, a large proportion of the guy who owns NPM also have responsibility in terms of security of the shelf application and, and custom application. And if you look at the population who owns SAM, the server and application monitor, they also have responsibility in terms of, in terms of security and in terms of uh, networks as well. So what we're trying to say is our audience is not application and server management specialist and on the other hand, network specialist. Our audience, I'm talking about SolarWinds, I'm not talking about, I mean, the big four and, and other guys obviously have more an enterprise approach, but our audience <coughs> is much more um, SMBs and medium-sized companies. Of course, we have a significant number of enterprise because we have a decent number of customers, but our audience is generalist, therefore the integration is something which is really required. All right, so let's take a quick look at, is that working?
I'm just trying to illustrate here for those who have never seen a, an Orion screen uh, that's all right, so that's a view of a certain number of products integrated into Orion. Remember, Orion is this common set of services, right? Basically, when you buy and install a new product on an existing Orion platform, what you get is an additional tab. You see home, network, NetFlow, config, device tracker application. Those are most of the product we just talked about. So they're um, basically a new tab. So the first level of integration is single sign-on. When you log in the platform, like I just did a second ago, Basically, you don't log in separately, I mean, on each of the products. You basically, um, you basically um, uh, have all products at your fingertips as soon as you've logged only once. Another way to view the integration is, so that's, that's what we call the home summary page, right? And basically, when you scroll down, you'll see that, for example, this chart is coming from NetFlow. You see the conversations between... I, again, I don't know if you can read, but between this user and this application, this is coming from NetFlow. You have application health overview. This is the SAM component, the server and application manager component that generates that. You have NCM managed devices. So uh, that tells you from a, a configuration management standpoint what, what, part, what devices are being managed. You have UDT ports in use. How many ports do I have used and, and not used? So the point I'm trying to make here is the single pane of glass integration. We can have on the same screen multiple different resources, right? These rectangles, we call them resources, coming from different products. The objective being to minimize the amount of click back and forth to navigate between products. Left aside, logging in different products. We try to eliminate all that. The objective is the whole thing becomes fuzzy. When you install these products, you actually don't exactly know in what product you are. This page are a mix and match of multiple resources from different products. So you don't have to care about, am I, am I in UDT? Am I in IPAN? Am I in, it doesn't matter. You're managing your network and hopefully this page gives you what's necessary to do so, yes. So what about the kind of non-standard networks that are out there, whether it be an open vSwitch on an open source platform, corner case, or maybe a, uh, a, an external network sitting at, at Amazon. Maybe you have part of your workload out there and you're using a security service as a virtual firewall. Uh, uh, maybe uh, load balancing as a service out there, HA proxy, or, or maybe an Amazon's product. Do you have any hooks into CloudWatch or into the exist or agents that you can put up to these external providers to pull that information in this, in this dashboard? No, we don't have those standards. And the reason is mostly because we don't see a large demand for those. However, what we have is, it, I mean, there, is always, there are always cases where um, people want to manage these kind of things and, 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 and import this kind of data. What we have that comes with the product is basically a tool that helps you integrating your own SNMP MIBs. That's mostly from an SNMP perspective. You can import your own MIBs. You can create your own metrics. You can create your own resources and basically reflect this information on the screen, even though it's not part of the out of the box. What about Part. platforms that, that export an API is not SNMP? Is there, do you have any uh, examples in the WAC forms maybe of, of how to munch that data into your platform? Well, we have for, we don't have a toolkit for the, for the customer to integrate this kind of API, but we support okay. some of these APIs. We support the UCS Manager API, we support the ESX API. Mm -hmm. um, what else do we have? Am I missing something? Um, we have WMI, which is not a SNMP, <coughs> uh, for Windows. So we can watch all that. in the future, maybe? I, we not, have discussions about that, but it's yeah, nothing that's funny. Well, uh, I've, had a, I've certainly had a lot of discussions with customers about it, and you know, we have customers increasingly are doing more and more virtualization. And they, the, the biggest things that we see is that the cloud providers are obviously not doing highly uh, detailed application monitoring, right? Mm -hmm. So that tends to be more, they'll actually go ahead and install some of the more application focused products in their cloud systems and actually watch that because they're actually concerned more about the services that are running or individual processes or maybe they have a custom homegrown piece of software or integration points. Yeah. So the cloud providers can't metric that. So in terms of, have we looked at the ability to say, hey, here's a list of the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, VMs that are spun up, and here's your elastic provision history over the last, you know, in number of days. That's that would be something that's really cool. Yeah. We just haven't seen a lot of customers who are asking for it, or and it may be that they're just using the consoles that are provided for that high level. You know, how busy are these? How busy are these machines? What's my uh, virtual network look like? The mm -hmm. the traffic or load balancing, or the rest of it, and that, that that's enough. 
but they seem to be more installing products sort of behind that to actually do the typical monitoring they would have done because, and it may just be that they're kind of wholesale pushing chunks of their infrastructure to the cloud mm -hmm. and they just like monitoring at the same level of detail they had. Right. Well, this is a question, so I mean, that's no, a good one. The two questions about API or agents that you're getting to pull into this dashboard. So. As soon as we see demand, I mean, we're happy to do non SNMP. We actually have quite a few, but everything is driven by demand. And in the SMBs, we don't see. What is it? What do you see as far as CloudWatch? Is it something you see being largely adopted and yeah. rapidly adopted? In, you say it has to be commercial. I see a lot of people moving their tier one applications, like it's app by app. So right. SaaS apps that are running externally. Right. Um, and, and whether your app's running internally or, or externally, there's a need to manage and monitor it, <coughs> get the user base, escalate back to your provider. Mm -hmm. um, I see it as an emerging segment, but um, I did a, a, a survey of uh, three out of, so I was up in Seattle, in my Seattle office, and I hold an open house, and three out of five of, the, of my customer segment 250 and below had already moved one tier one application either to Amazon or Azure. Interesting. Right. Um, and mm -hmm. so it's, it's, so there's that shift. There's obviously, you know, the file storage shift, everyone moves their Dropbox, and right. then Silicon Valley, I mean, we're all stupid here, so you know, there's all sorts of crazy Amazon stuff going on here, but this is a little isolated bubble. So how, so let's take the example of Amazon. Are, are they doing a good job at providing basically the applications required to manage the server, not the server, but mostly the application? What, what, what's the quality of the tool that provides? The CloudWatch API, so the Expose API, so you can query them. Although a lot of people are uh, putting up either Xenos or Nagios, and they're right. just your point in certain agents in, in the instances <coughs> they pop up. I'm an application monitor, but uh, you know, I, I see more and more people starting to write tools to query, uh, to query CloudWatch, and then for OpenStack, Solometer just got just got merged in for um, for Grizzly shipping in April. Similar, it's basically a clone of CloudWatch. So it's basically a set of APIs that you know, say the new SNMP, you might say, um, to query get information state about not only your instances but all these infrastructure services that are provided. I mean, load balancing is a great example. So I have. You know, I might have an auto-scaling group for my server, so I'm trusting my cloud provider to tr to add more instances mm -hmm. behind an elastic load balancer, or HA props, right. or whatever. Well, how do I monitor and make sure that actually happens? And the reality of life is no one's like all up at Amazon, or all up at Rackspace, or all in their data center. There's some mix of it. Right. And having one unified view to manage, maintain, and operate that is, I mean, heck, I have- It's valuable, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. me, myself, my company, we got, a bunch of stuff, a bunch of really expensive blinking stuff in our data centers mm -hmm. and our DR site, and then you know, a portion of our quoting application runs on Amazon, for another portion that's in, integrated on um, on Salesforce.com, right? Well, it doesn't matter. I don't care if it's at Salesforce, on you know, some Heroku backend, or if it's at Amazon, or if it's in our data center, because broke is broke. Right. right. Well, and it, it's it's interesting to hear you ask that because I'm I've been kind of pushing it for a long time and you know if, if it, we don't have a bunch of customers asking for it then it's automatically you know not going to be the top of the priority but to, to me you know compare it with something like the uh, vSphere APIs which yeah. have been in flux mm -hmm. on and off for a well, long time the yeah the, the but the, the cloud management APIs have been pretty stable and yeah. they're fairly straightforward mm -hmm. to work with so that seems like that'd be a slam dunk especially because I mean you just said the word blink and lights right if you're if you've been managing that infrastructure in your data center mm -hmm. it's comforting to have it heavily instrumented and so when you push stuff off to cloud, it, it's disconcerting to not be able to see, especially those top level lights, like network or ELB use, utilization, or some of, you know, yeah. how many times have we seen stuff go down now, large infrastructures die in the last six months, and For it ends EBS. up. Yeah, and EBS. Yeah. EBS latency, a great example, something which I believe you can manage your, your block service latencies, you can pull that up, right? Some within the storage platform side of this. It's, and for me, you know, I want my knock to be able to see it all. I don't care where it is. Yeah, right. Well, that makes sense. Um, I'll, yeah. I'll do a quick test. I'll go on Slack and look for CloudWatch. Here, here, here's the challenge is most, it's more the development team. So there's, you know, it's a challenge most IT, IT centric sales organizations and product organizations. They go and they talk to their, their IT organizations that report to the CIO. And what's happening is, you know, like, what was the latest, well, the latest survey that came out of, uh, um, what's called um, Pacific Crest was 41% uh, of CIOs control less than 50% of the budget. Right, so there's this whole, other, all these other organizations that no businesses talk to that actually, do, that, that, that have very things very important to them. So the dev teams, application development teams, you know, they're, they're trying to figure it out on their own and then lines of business are saying, you know, screw IT, I, I'm gonna go buy this cool app that's running somewhere yeah, else. And IT is like, whoa, wait a minute, but they call me when it's broke. Right. You know? So even though your IT customers may not be asking for CloudWatch, you know, it's, it's always worth, hey, can, you, can I talk to your VP of application development and ask what he's doing? Are you doing that Stuff like that, and then ask them what they're using. Yeah, it's a good point. All right, 
Can I kill that? It's already around. Oh, that's a good. That's a good point. All right. Uh, I'll skip the second example. So that was the point on integration. That that's something which is important for us. Uh, the, we have a significant effort ongoing for the acquired product to become integrated. For example, FSM, the Firewall Security Manager, was actually integrated before, but we're making this integration uh, better. So integration is, is pretty important for us. 